Welcome, everyone, to The Thresholds of Reality, the podcast where we explore unexplained and mysterious events, phenomena, and legends. Today, we're talking to the noteworthy Robert Clotworthy, narrator of Ancient Aliens and the Curse of Oak Island. Strap yeah. in as we examine the edges of the unknown. Robert, thank you for, for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. So our our little podcast here is devoted primarily to the weird and strange stuff. And, and probably one of the weirdest and strangest TV shows in history is Ancient Aliens. Do you agree with that? It's, um, you know, it's interesting. We've been doing it for, I want to say, 15 seasons now. Does that make sense? 15 yeah. seasons. Which means, and it's actually been probably a little bit longer in the way that we, you know, meaning we at the, uh, with the producers, how we name the shows or because sometimes it's like two seasons in one year. So we've actually been doing it uh, probably even longer than, than 15 seasons. But yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting show because it started out as just, you know, basically one two hour special on the History Channel. And it just took off from there. The the audience found it. So yeah, it's a it's strange, it's peculiar. We tackle a lot of subjects, but I think we've got some really fascinating theorists that come on the show. And we basically just ask the questions. We don't tell you what the answers are. We say, this is what history tells us. This is what the hieroglyphs tell us. This is what the pyramids tell us. What do you think? So yeah, it's uh it's it's pretty fascinating. Plus we've done over 200 shows. Yeah, so, it's been on since 2009. Yeah, when, you, when you're talking about 200 shows, you're going to be tackling some pretty bizarre subjects. Yeah. But, but to, a credit to the producers, every week is, is, is incredibly fascinating to me. I just did one last week that deals with, I think it's airing, maybe it'll air Friday. I mean, we're, we're really that, that close to, to air dates about, uh, about time travel. And it's really, it's, it, it's, it blows my mind. It, it just, all of a sudden the concepts of, you know, for example, we, we bring up the, uh, uh, the point that light and sound travels at different speeds. Right. So what is the proper time when you see me or when you hear me, it's too, even though it may be a, a millisecond since, since we're standing close together, what is what time is it really? Is that just a, a a human construct, or does it have something to do with the universe? I mean, when we when we take a telescope and we look to the edge of time, we're looking into the past, like right. out of the present. We're looking at stars that don't that no longer exist. So, what is the present? What is the past? What is the future? It's all, you know, it's 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 fascinating. It's not just physical, it's philosophical too. Yeah. Absolutely. It has to be. It has to be. And it could be interdimensional. We don't know. And and the show's premise is pretty simple, I'd say, which is to what extent it's like an exploration of, of the extent to which aliens may or may not have been behind some of the the most interesting or incredible events in human history, right? Yeah. And it goes from the construction of ancient monuments like the pyramids all the way to things like the inventions of Nikola Tesla. Mm -hmm. um, but you've been involved since the very beginning as the narrator. Yes. How did that happen? How did you get involved with the show? I think I'm the only one that has been on every single episode. Yeah. Knock on, knock on wood. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how did, how did the producers, uh, you know, approach you? Was there an audition process? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, the story that I usually tell at the conventions is is not true, but it's funny <laughs> because I, I, I don't, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a ham. I, when I show up to the conventions and hopefully we'll be having more conventions again soon, 
uh, I understand what my place is. I'm not one of the theorists. I'm not one of the people that are the deep thinkers that are contemplating all the different facets of ancient of the ancient astronaut theory and how it impacts or has impacted life on Earth. I'm there more to, you know, introduce people to kind of tell a story, to add a little bit of, uh, of, of humor to it so, so that it's fun. Because I think that this whole thing is, it's deep, it's interesting, it's fascinating, but it, it's also enjoyable because it, it does kind of expand your mind a little bit and get you to thinking in different areas that you that you may not have normally gone. So the story that I tell, and I here's the truthful part, is I used to, I did work for the producer, uh, the late Kevin Burns, uh, on many, many documentaries before. The first time I worked with him was on a documentary about the making of the, of the original Star Wars trilogy. And then mm, yeah. the documentary called um, uh, The Legacy Revealed, also about Star Wars, but more about the mythology behind it. So I'd worked with him for many, many shows. And uh, so the story that I tell, and this is where it deviates into, into fiction, is, is that he called me up and he said, Robert, I've got this new show that I'm putting together. It's called Ancient Aliens. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. Um, and it's about, like what you said, it's about how life as we know it may have been affected by the intervention of aliens in the past. And I said, well, Kevin, I have a couple of questions for you. The first question is, is it possible? And, and I said, no, I say the second question, of course, the audience starts to laugh. And the second question is, could it be? And he looks at me and he says, he says, Robert, I need to know your answer. Are you in or are you out? And I said, well, Kevin, ancient astronaut theorists say yes. <laughs> at that point i saw ancient astronaut theorists say and i hold the mic microphone out towards the crowd and they all shout as one yes so it, it's a lot of fun but, but yeah i had worked for him on many documentaries and he uh he just thought my voice would be would be perfect for for the show and uh i am eternally grateful to him for uh for, for that because it certainly did uh, change my life and it's certainly I've created great friends, and I've been working with these people now, the producers, for close to twenty years. It's amazing. And I agree. Your your voice is a perfect fit for this show. It is absolutely <laughs> a perfect fit. I, you know, I I listen to it, and sometimes I think, oh God, what am I? Why did I even get hired? But <laughs> but other times I'm thinking, you know what? There's something about it. What what he would tell me uh, is that sometimes I'll have to kind of phrase this in a way that's a little bit gentler. He would say that sometimes he writes this stuff and he goes, I, I just don't know if I can, I believe this. Um, he would use different terminology. And then he, <laughs> and he said, I would say it. And I think maybe, maybe it's possible. I, I have that, uh, I guess, unique ability to tell the story and tell it in a way that's not off-putting it's it's very inclusive. I'm kind of drawing you in a little bit because I'm intrigued by the information. I took on yeah. his point of view, which was he was a skeptic who's open to the information. So I'm not going into the show poo-pooing it, thinking this is all crap. I'm not going into the show and thinking this is this is the Bible, this is the absolute truth, this is the word of God. No. I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe there's something here. And with all the shows that we've done, uh, there's so much, uh, so much evidence out there that it only has to be right once for it to be true. Yeah, I, I think there's a, a mountain of evidence, and of course, we find out more and more each and every day. Yeah, and it, you, the thing about your voice is that it lends it lends credibility to the whole thing because you're not saying this is true. You're kind of gently persuading or, or coaxing the audience to come with you on this little journey. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, you either believe it or you don't, or, or you have some questions, maybe you do a little bit more research, but it's all about the journey. It's exploring some of these, these ideas. Uh, and there's so, there's so much we don't know about ourselves. It's, it's fascinating to think that we're, we're all human beings. We can go back. I don't know thousands and thousands and thousands of years of, 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 you know, recorded history, let's say to, you know, BC. And yet we still don't know, you know, who built the pyramids 
or who, who built the Sphinx, for example. Right. The, you know, the Egyptians just kind of found it. Well, uh, okay. Why would somebody do that? You know, the, here's something that's fascinating about, about the pyramids that I discovered on a show that we did this year. And there's always something new that comes out is that the latitude and longitude of where the Great Pyramid of Giza is, is the exact speed of light in meters. What? Yes. Yes. It's the exact speed of light in meters per second. How no. does that happen? How is that possible? Put it like a mile over here, it would be different. Um, you know, two miles that way, different. But no, right there. Wow. Uh, That's it, incredible. Is it just chance? And that was... and. And Dr. Travis Taylor mentioned that on the show. He's a wow. legitimate rocket scientist. Okay. Today I learned. It's, a, it's, it's fascinating. So you've heard all these stories about aliens and, and all these different people talk. Yeah. Now, we were having this discussion on our last show mm -hmm. about when we thought aliens have actually visited. Like, do you think they stopped? Like, I think that's when they actually showed up. It's right around the time of building the pyramids. I think that's because of how far time, you know, how far distance planets are from each other. It takes time. And I think that is actually when they made their appearance and they were like, okay, well, they're a little primitive right now. You know, maybe we'll give them a little push, but overall, what period of time do you think they showed up? Like, that's what I think they showed up. And uh, I think they showed up then. You know, you know, we're getting back to, to, to time again. And, What's the age of, of the planet Earth? It's what, a, a billion years or more? Mm -hmm. 4.6 billion. Yeah, who's to say that there haven't been multiple um, species that have lived and died and disappeared, including humans, over that four or five billion years? Uh, in fact, I when I was in the, in the green room once over at, at one of the uh, alien cons, I was listening to you know, Linda Moulton Howe talking to, you know, David Childress or, you know, George Hughes. I mean, they're all, and when these people talk, you don't interrupt. You just basically mm -hmm. do this and listen in. And they were talking about how every, what did she say? I'm trying to remember, like every 2 million years or 200,000 years, whatever the heck it is, basically everything that's on the bottom makes it to the top and everything that was on the top is now on the bottom. It's constantly like revolving. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. So when you, the, the, how come... When they dig for something, you know, they always find something older than they ever expected. It's you're always finding something older. Yeah. Not like we've hit the hit the that it. That's as far as we can go. There's nothing beyond this. There's always some evidence of of some creature or some human activity or something that's older than they possibly thought. So, wh when do I think they arrived? I haven't a clue. In, maybe they never left. Maybe they never left. And, and you talked about time. We did a show that was that aired last Friday, which I thought was fascinating. Was was called the Shadow People, and you talked about you know aliens being involved with these big events, you know, building the pyramids, you know, the Great mm -hmm. Flood, whatever it might be. But it's also small events. It's just you know a visitation. All of a sudden, you know, somebody's in your room, or you think, or you feel a presence. That's not that's not earth shattering, but it's impactful to you. And they yeah. talk. Shadow people. Maybe these people, they're traveling in a different dimension. Maybe they're able to bend time. So when they appear and disappear, and it, you know, it just happens like in the the edge of your eyesight. Maybe that's what's happening. Is is they're just able to pop in, pop out, and there's not this great challenge of traveling from you know 38 light years away to get here to Earth. Maybe you can make it in, you know, a fraction of a second. Who knows? Instantaneous. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's and what, not. that was uh, Sam's argument last episode. That's what that was what his stance was. My stance was, I'm having a hard time. I still think of it as like, you know, we're still primitive in the, the uh, in traveling. Oh yeah, we're we're very you know we're in the grand scheme of things we're still rolling over. Oh oh yeah, I mean you we're know, like, we're just crawling out of the cave. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was saying. You know, they probably have it away. So, you know, that when they're traveling, it, it's a matter of seconds. Yeah. I mean, you, you look back on other cultures, ancient cultures, what we're experiencing now in their in their time 
it would have been a miracle. It would have been unthinkable. It would have been unimaginable. Uh, so imagine what's going to happen 500 years from now. They're going to look back on 2022, and it's it's like we're, you know, like I said, a, a caveman walking out of a uh, out of a cave for the first time, mm -hmm. and yeah. starting you know building fire. Now you've done you've done a lot of episodes from <laughs> yeah. yeah aliens in the Third Reich to <laughs> yeah. uh, to Machu Picchu yeah and uh, is there are there any episodes that really stand out to you as like these are high quality or or maybe maybe um, worldview altering episodes yeah is this is your favorites what are your favorites well, first I'll tell you the one that was my least favorite. Because that's <laughs> funny, where we, we talked about Bigfoot and whether Bigfoot was some kind of an alien-human hybrid experiment gone wrong. I thought, I, I don't know. I, this is kind of stretching it for me. But my favorite episode of all time was the one about the moon. Because the moon is unlike any uh, thing else that we know of in the universe. First of all, we only have one of them around our planet. Yeah. A lot of planets have multiple multiple moons. It happens to be the exact size and an exact location where you can get a solar eclipse. I mean, what are the odds of that? That it would be right there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, if it was closer, you wouldn't get it. If it was further away, it wouldn't happen. It has to be right there. It's also, it doesn't rotate. It's, it's, it's just, it's all the same sign is always facing us. If we didn't have the moon, we wouldn't ha and, and have our planet kind of tilted on its axis. We wouldn't have tides. We wouldn't have the changes in seasons. Uh, there'd be all kinds of things that would be different. Plus, plus I met a woman who was at one of these conventions, who was a scientist at NASA. She was there during the Apollo launches. She actually worked in mission control. Her job was to monitor the life, uh, uh, you know, like the vitals, the life, life, the vital, the life, vital systems of the, of the astronauts that were on the mission. And she was sitting in the control room and she's, you know, you know, you, you watch Apollo 13, you see all those people that are in mission control. She's in that room. And I'm trying to remember who the um, who the command module pilot was. I'm drawing a blank. It was it was the, like the next to last or last Apollo mission, and um, he was of course in the command module. The other two uh, astronauts are on the planet or uh, are, are on the moon, and when he's on the backside of them, when he's out of radio contact, mm -hmm. uh, he is not able to communicate with anybody. Well, he comes from the dark side of the moon. And he's now in radio contact and the commander of the mission is actually on the moon. And he just has a, as a joke says, uh, Hey, uh, you're lonely up there. And the command module pilot says, I'm not alone. What? They, yes. They immediately switched to a secure channel because, you know, this was being broadcast for the world to hear. So sh she switched to a secure channel. It's her job. And she overhears the conversation and they said, Hey, uh, you joking? What's, what's going on up there? He says, no, something's flying here with me. Something's in formation. He describes it as, and she tells me that when he used to fly his, his favorite food to eat before he would go on a mission, whether it was a combat mission he, and he was a fighter pilot in Vietnam. So this guy was not, you know, uh, uh, weak in the knees. He's not easily. Yeah, yeah. And he says, uh, he says it's his favorite favorite food was was Oscar Mayer wieners. So he says it's it looks like an Oscar Mayer wiener. And she told me that's one of the most common shapes for UFOs. It's either cigar shaped or it's triangular shaped. And he describes it that the, the command module that he's in is roughly 17 feet long from stem to stern. He said that this one was over 40 feet long. Dang. He said it was not Russian. Because it was not American. He didn't know what it was. It followed him in formation for, I think she said, three and a half revolutions around the moon and then disappeared. She met him. Or she saw him uh, on the uh, uh, the ship that you know brought them you 
when they landed in the ocean, the, the recovery ship. And she saw him in one of the staterooms there on, on the ship. And he was just like sitting there kind of stunned. And she walked and she said, hey, you know, how are you doing? He goes, uh, well, it was uh, that, that was like a mission I'd never been on my life. She says, oh, are you talking about the, quote, anomaly? And he said, he says, you're aware of it? He goes, yeah, I was, I was in the loop. And he just said he didn't know what it was. He'd never seen anything like that in his life. And it was wow. showing to photographs of it. Those photographs have never been seen. I asked her, what was NASA's opinion about this? And she says, NASA doesn't have an opinion at the time. At, when, they're, when a mission is going on, all they basically do is just gather the information. Then they hand it off to the brain trust to figure out what it all means. But they were told after that conversation that was broadcast, everybody that was in loops, that they said, don't talk to anybody about this. Come we, on. We don't know what it is. We don't want anybody speculating. We don't want any opinions. We're going to give it to the people that, that know what, what to do about it. They'll, they'll talk about it. And this was something I kind of had to pull out of her a little bit. It wasn't like she came up to me and said, hey, I got a story to tell you. She came up and just wanted a photograph, wanted to talk to me a little bit and blah, blah, blah. And there weren't very many people there. And I just got into a conversation. And as she was walking away, I said, hey, um, can you anything ever happen? At, at NASA that you never really talked about, but you know, you could. And she said, well, statute of limitations is X, Y, Z. And yeah, I can talk about it. And she, and she told me the story. I ended up having her on the, uh, the show. We ended up interviewing her. That's wow. incredible. Oh my gosh. So, so what's your take on all of the, the uh, 2020 UFO videos that the military released? It's just probably the tip of the iceberg. Right. Probably, I mean, they, they do show a lot of those like tic tac shaped yeah, objects, right? Probably much more high def stuff out there. I mean, the stuff that we've seen is kind of blurry. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, you talk to the pilots, they can't explain it. It's, it defies the law of physics as we know it. How something can travel that fast and make a basically a, a 45 degree turn, on, you know, with a sharp edge is makes no sense. How it can go from X number of feet down to x number of feet in in a millisecond it's it defies anything that we can do it's not even we can even come close to that yeah i heard once that if we if we tried to make those kind of turns our brains would smash into the side of our skull yeah and we'd, be, we'd be dead instantly <laughs> yeah yeah it's you, you can't first of all you can't you can't do it because i mean the law of physics says you know while that you know something's in motion is going to remain in motion it doesn't just all of a sudden you know turn on a dime. I mean, yeah. even, even when, when we do theoretically turn on a dime, there's a little bit of a curve to it mm -hmm. because momentum is, is carrying you. That's insane. Um, so that, that is an impressive story. I, I love that story. Are there any stories that have made you laugh out loud where you're like, come on, <laughs> no, no, come on. And it was hard to hard to get through your narration because the story was so just out there. Well, I, I, the first time, the first time that I saw in a script where the ancient astronaut theorists said, no, I, I thought that was a typo. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> session, I had to go, wait a minute, wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. are they really saying no? <laughs> <laughs> it's too it's a bridge too far even for them they're uh, like no no nope, can't have it. but you know since then they've said no a few times uh they uh you know they say maybe <laughs> and also you know here's the here's the interesting thing is that i've i'm really good friends with uh, with giorgio and uh we, we talk quite often and it's not that all the people on the show are of exactly the same opinion on everything there is diversity there. There are, you know, Georgia will say, ex, you know, this person thinks that that makes no sense. Somebody else would say, you make no sense. So it's not like this, it's this monolith of, 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 of uh, opinion that comes forth. So when they say yes, it's not like they take a vote. Um, but it, it's, there is diversity there. There is, there is people that, there are people on the show that have divergent opinions about certain things. And also there are people that have had their opinions change over time as more evidence comes out to, to their credit. And all of them are, are brilliant. I mean, first of all, they're a personalities. They're, they're not 
mm-hmm. you know, wallflowers. They're they're gonna they're gonna speak. They're gonna speak uh, articulately. And you know, Linda Moulton Howe impresses me because she can talk and she never says uh, uh never never pauses. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. She's she has this ability to think and and put the words out at this at the same time. Um, and all of them, but at the same time, even though they're all eight personalities, when they get together, there, there's respect, there is uh, admiration uh, for each and every one of them, and the, I, I find them, inc- and we all get along. <laughs> That's what's also incredible. Everybody's a, is a really good friend. That's so, amazing. That's amazing. that's hard to do even in a small podcast. Yeah. yeah, it's an amazing group of people that Kevin, the late Kevin Burns, put together. He he had this this amazing ability to find interesting people that were able to articulate their positions well and also had charisma because that's that's really important. Yeah, Absolutely. you got you have to 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 keep the audience interested. Also, yeah, I mean you, ha- you have to. You know, Georgie all of a sudden became the guy with the hair. He became the he became. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is his hair like that in, in real life, or does he just do that for the show? Well, I'll I'll tell you a, a funny story about how, <laughs> how that all happened because I've uh, I've asked him about it, <laughs> and I, first of all, I heard that this story was was the truth, and I verified it with him and said, "Yeah, that's what happened." He uh, he was he was asked to be on the show because. Um, Kevin Burns had had, I guess, utilized him on a, a, a show that we did about I think Indiana Jones and the Temple of and and the and the, the Crystal Skulls. We did a documentary about about that, and he was brought on uh, as as an expert. And Kevin remembered him, thinking, "Oh, that guy's interesting. Let's let's bring him onto the show." So they brought him out to uh, to Los Angeles, and they put him up at this hotel in Santa Monica and they were going to get to him. They were going to get to him and, and days would go by and they kept pushing it back for whatever reason. So he was just hanging out in the hotel room. And I guess somebody forgot to call him the night before and tell him that they were going to actually shoot his stuff first thing in the morning. <laughs> well, they, they, they arrive at his hotel room at, I don't know, seven in the morning or eight or whatever the hell it was first thing. And he answers the door and they said, are you ready? He goes, what do you mean ready? He says, yeah, we're, we're going to shoot. He goes, I- I'm not ready. I, I haven't taken a shower. Look at my hair. They said, you look fine. You're fine. So, so basically that was his, his, his bed hair. <laughs> but, but they went with it. And it, it just kind of resonated with the, with the audience. And now, now he does, he does his own thing. Yeah. I think with each season, it gets a little bit more expansive. It, it, <laughs> I think it depends. I mean, I think early on he used to get notes from the network about it to kind of tone it down a little bit, but now they realize that, listen, people are, are digging this. this they're, they're recognizing him f- for that. They're resonating with it. They're having some fun and he enjoys it. He's, he's yeah. really, really cool about it. It's totally a draw. Yeah. He, he shouldn't it's, be, shouldn't be embarrassed by that. Yeah. He does a great job. Yeah. Um, by the way, the guy is smart. He speaks like you know, seven or eight different languages. <laughs> it's, it's, it's insane. The amount of information yeah. he's got. He's, he's awesome. Uh, and I, I did see that crystal skull documentary you guys did. Yeah. That was a fascinating, fascinating background on those objects. Yeah. Um, now, as far as you personally, do you have any theories or, or experiences or close encounters that you've had that, that we have yet to see on, on the show. <laughs> oh my goodness. Have I had any close encounters? You know, it's, it's like, I, I always default to some kind of a, a humorous answer because, you know, I live in Los Angeles. I'm <laughs> <laughs> freak- That's a good point. Blast the from the past is, is all different. about that. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't recognize you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I've gone to movies where I go down to, you know, Hollywood Boulevard to see a movie and I, I see Spider-Man <laughs> out there or, or somebody dressed as Frankenstein. So it's it's I, I wouldn't recognize an alien if he came up and said, hi, I'm an alien. <laughs> that's the that's the men in black approach, right? They say, oh, everybody, everybody who's a little weird is an alien. Yeah. And, and they don't live in New York. They live in Los Angeles. comes to Los Angeles. <laughs> that's hilarious. Now. You are also the narrator for another couple shows about mm-hmm. treasure hunting, which is also kind of a mysterious thing, even though it's a lot more down to earth. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them 
And I think they're both by the same team, right? One of them is the Curse of Oak Island. Yes. And the, and the other one is the Curse of Civil War Gold, right? Civil War Gold is no longer on the air, but Curse of Oak Island is. I also do a show called Beyond Oak Island. Right, right. It's kind of a, a call it a spinoff from that where we explore some of the treasure stories and treasure mysteries around the world. So we go out of Oak Island and Nova Scotia and expand it to uh, different parts of the world. But yeah, and Oak Island is the number one show on the History Channel. It's the number one show on cable Tuesday nights, most nights, unless there's you know a State of the Union address or some big basketball mm -hmm. game. We're right up there at the top. We get close to 3 million people tuning in each and every week to watch that show. And we're I'm, I'm rooting for them. Season. Kyle's an avid fan. I, I, I just think it's crazy that they've put so much time and effort and money and in, in, in the, uh, you know, just like those brothers, just from the hopes of something that they read when they were kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's, they have put, they have dedicated so much of their lives and like so much of this small Island that they have like to hoping to find this. I just, it just, it captivates me. Yeah. It's, it's first of all, the show is completely le legitimate. These guys, Marty and Rick Lagina are truly trying to do this. And you really hit the nail on the head because this was a childhood dream of theirs. And they found themselves in the position this was prior to uh, us starting to document it. Uh, Marty had invested well, had a, had a successful business. So they had the money to basically do whatever they wanted to do up at that island. And Marty supported his brothers, Rick, and, and his dream to finally solve this mystery where people literally, they've been looking for treasure there for over 200 years. I say it in the opening, but it has been over 200 years people have been looking. Why? Why in that small little island are all these people trying to find something there? What What is it about it? And I think that having that childhood dream and being, being able to be in the position where you can you can actually find out you can you can go on that journey you can take that that trip you can you can find out whether it's true or not is something that resonates with all of us first of all who doesn't imagine buried treasure out there as a kid or even as an adult going out there with a you know a little metal detector mm -hmm. finding a coin or, or or going on the beach and your beach combing and you find something that's cool or interesting and these guys are able to do to do it on a scale that is uh, no one has ever done before, and the Crazy. relationship that they have mm -hmm. is, as brothers, I think, is fascinating. They fight sometimes. It's not like they don't argue. Uh, Marty is a little bit more pragmatic. Rick is a little bit more of a dreamer, and yet they have to find a compromise. Also, it's about putting together a group of people with a common goal and having it function, whether they find something or not, that's it'd be great if they do, but it's, but just to watch how people uh, try to solve problems, how they have a, a collective goal that they're trying to attain is, is to me, I think is, is quite interesting and it's totally unique. And for some reason, well, maybe for all those reasons, it really has resonated with, with the viewers. People just can't get enough of it. I know people are frustrated because, well, you know, why don't they find anything? So, well, it, it's not a show about necessarily finding treasure. Maybe you find it. When you lose your keys, you go, ah, why haven't you found your keys yet? No, you keep looking until you find them, mm -hmm. right? And they find enough clues and enough stuff there to keep that dream alive, to keep it going. And uh, also with what's been happening in the world to have a show that is just a treasure show. It's just a treasure hunt. These guys are trying to find something. There's purity in that. And there's, a, a, you can kind of escape some of the crap that's going on in the world and just watch mm -hmm. what these guys are trying to do on a small island in Nova Scotia. And they bring in these giant machines. <laughs> My goodness. I was asking the producer, I said, I said, I, how far in advance do you have to plan for this machine? Because I remember saying this was a custom built, you know, hundred ton, whatever the heck it was. I was about to, I was about to curse. Hundred ton machine from from Korea. 
I, my first question was, how far in advance do you have to order that? It's not like it's it's not like it's at Home Depot and it's on the mm. shelf and you just just it just is delivered. You, and then how does it get there? It, was it built in Korea? Did they bring it across the ocean? Did they drive it across Canada? Did they go through the Panama Canal? How did it get there? And then last week I asked, said, "What happens to it when they're done? Yeah. Where? Did yeah, they, whose garage do they store it in? <laughs> is it like if they bought it now, so there's like a I don't know a, a field somewhere where you know like where they park seven forty sevens or something. That's there's all this giant equipment that's just sitting there. It's." Yeah. It's fascinating to me. It's fascinating. No, now, it's not it, like they haven't found cool. anything. No. During the course of the show, the teams unearthed like uh, several 17th and 18th century coins, buttons, some brooches, yeah, and even some like some gold. Um, and like, and look, it sounds like some of the older finds are like 12th century Templar knight gear. Um, so it seems like this. This island has treasures from around the world. Something's going on. Do Something. we have any idea about how all that stuff got there? That's what they're trying to figure out. That's part of the mystery. If you find something from, let's say, the 1200s, yeah, theoretically, I guess somebody in you know 2011 could have had this old thing in his pocket and just dropped it, and and there it is. Right, that's a possibility, not a great possibility. It's probably more likely that it came there roughly about that time. Now, what so was what someone I'm, doing there? What I'm hearing from you is you think Nicolas Cage has something to do with this. <laughs> it's not confirming or denying. You know, I cannot confirm or deny that Nick Cage is involved. Uh, that I, it definitely uh, <laughs> works against my, the NDA that I signed. <laughs> that's great what are what are some of the things that have surprised you that they pulled out of the ground well first of all the whole thing that they they that that water device that they sent down i, I mean first of all when, when i when i get these scripts i don't get the script in advance i don't want to know what's going on either ancient aliens or the curse of oak island i am pretty good about getting the words off the page right away and also i want to be I want to be influenced. I want my performance, my read to be influenced by the information that I'm I'm getting. So when I'm getting it, it's if it's interesting to me, if I'm curious about it, it just kind of adds to the the truth of what it is I'm trying to say for the audience. And one of the things that fascinated me was this this uh, it was a, a device that they dropped down into one of the you know the pits that they that they mm -hmm. do and it basically goes through the water but it's closed and then it kind of opens up at the very bottom so you get a sample of the water that's at the very bottom as opposed to something that's in the middle and then they go and they take that water and they analyze it and they find traces of gold and silver in there now where did that come from or, or maybe you know was the analyzing machine that they put it in faulty I doubt it. No way. But there's something there, which which leads you to go, wow. If if something is able to kind of dissolve enough or affect the water, so you can get the you can get the the residue from gold and silver, and I don't know how it happens, but it's there. That's interesting to me. That that just leads you to wonder, okay, what's going on? Um, you know, it's the the road that they that they built. The how about the uh, the the wharf that they found that was under the water. When they when they yeah. named Smith's Cove, it's like, who's going to build something underwater? You can't. There must have been no water there to build yeah. it. I'm more interested in how they they came across the machine to put into the hole <laughs> to analyze the water. Like like how much I I'd like to know how much time they actually put into figuring out. Okay, what but, kind of device do we need next that's going to help us? That, you know, find that, a clue. It, I, I well, know that, I, it amazes me because it, it's not like you just wing it, right? I mean, they do I, a lot of people that that contact them directly that say, "Hey, I've got a theory, I've got an idea, and if it makes sense or or we're curious about what that might be, we'll bring them onto the show and and we'll go for it a little bit." But yeah, you're right. I, I you know, how, how would you know? They go they go talk to the guys in Antarctica who are drilling down through the ice two three miles into the ice. 
and say, hey, can you loan that to us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, they may have, they may have a, a, a team of researchers that just have not been on the show that kind of, you know, help them figure out what they're going to do. Uh, or maybe it's just the guys that are in the war room. They just do their research, come up with different ideas, read an article and say, hey, how about this? How about that? I, I really don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. I just, I've always thought that, it's like the, you know, just because, you know, they you can tell they put a lot of time and energy into planning what they want, what they think they need to do. And you know that either they're yeah either they they have a team of people that are helping them or or they spend a lot of time on Google. Yeah, you have you have to be <laughs> careful because we're talking real money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I remember one of the episodes once it was like, okay, we've got enough money to to dr drill one more hole. Where do you want it? Where do you want it to be? And it's not like it's just oh sure no problem no problem no problem just go it's go like go. Fingers crossed we find something. Yeah mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. And these giant, um, I, I, what I, I'm trying to what they call them now. I, I say it so much, now I can't even, caissons. <laughs> these, these giant caissons that are like 10 foot wide. If it's, if I remember Marty Blake I took a photograph. He was up there. He's on Beyond Oak Island, the host. And he was standing inside of it. And it was, you know, he's six foot tall and it was four feet higher than him. Wow. And then, of course, what do you do with the dirt that's on the inside? I yeah, mean, you got to put it somewhere. You gotta put it somewhere. I mean, the, logistically, it's just crazy. Or, or you're bringing in a machine that weighs, you know, forty tons. You don't just draw, you know, drive it across the lawn and hope for the best. You got to prepare the pad, put gravel, mm -hmm. to make sure it doesn't tip, all kinds of stuff. They're, the logistics are intense. It's it, it's stuff that no, that that regular people probably wouldn't think of. Like I wouldn't think to put to make a gravel road so this heavy machine. Like, you know, in my excitement, I would just have it out there and I would be the guy that just the episode would be because it's stuck. <laughs> you know? Yeah, all the all the uh what the bonehead uh decisions that they make, right? <laughs> yeah, the blooper, the blooper reel. <laughs> blooper reel, exactly. Um so have you have you seen any of these objects in person? Are they are they giving them out to the crew? I mean, well, I, I joke that sometimes, you know, when the producer comes in, that I'll know if they find something if he's if he is bringing in the uh, the Ark of the Covenant. I do. Yeah. I, it'll be like the Stanley Cup. Everybody gets to carry it around for one day. <laughs> but uh, no, I haven't. I haven't seen personally. No, I, I've seen photographs where you know on somebody's cell phone. They'll say, "Oh, Marty just found something." Blah blah blah, and they send a picture, and here, you know, they'll show me something. But, but that's it. Yeah, yeah. There, there's that very ornate gold brooch that I think is probably the my favorite object that they pulled out. Um, and I'd, are they storing it in a museum? Or are they keeping it in their home in a collection, like a trophy room? I, I, I don't know. There's, there's a. Uh, there's some kind of an agreement that they have to follow with uh, with Canada, and you know if you find something uh, uh, that is of historical value, you can't just take it. You know, right. like, like for example, I know this season they uh, were drilling and they found broken pieces of uh, of pottery from uh, from the Mi'kmaqs, and it was which a, a tribe that existed there at, at a certain time, and because of that, they're not allowed to dig. That's that's like no, this is now a protected site. So if they find something, they have to. Uh, God, I'm trying to remember because in just the last couple of episodes they've talked about it. It's like you've got to uh, prove somehow. You have to be very careful environmentally. Mm -hmm. And if they find something, they have to disclose that to to uh, to Canada, and then Canada will make the decision as to whether they get to keep it or whether uh, you know. Canada is going to take possession of it. I know that they did something very recently where they were underwater. They're looking for, uh, you know, a shipwreck or something. And they weren't allowed to actually dig into the sand. You could only like, like feather it, you know, use like your hand to just kind of blow it across the top of it or use uh, some kind of a, a device to kind of see with underneath what's there, but it's like a ground penetrating radar kind of a thing, but they have to be very careful. So they have, certain restrictions and especially this season it seems like there's been more restrictions than in the past mm -hmm. and to me that means they're finding something they're finding yeah. 
if all of a sudden can is saying, no, 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 wait, 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 what, what you found? What, no, no, let's, let's take it a little bit slower. That shows to me that they're finding something of, of value. So I take that as a good sign, even though it's frustrating for them and frustrating for the audience. And, you know, even frustrating for me, I, I'd read it and go, are you kidding me? They can't dig. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay, okay. Okay. So they have, they have to do, it's not like they do a workaround. They have to, you know, come up with a, with a strategic plan, present that to the government. The government has to approve it in certain things, and then they're allowed to go in and do, do it. Um, but they have to prove, you know, they have to jump through a certain amount of hoops or, or check off a certain number of boxes before they're allowed to do certain things. But so again, by that, they, if they do find the treasure, then they can't keep it because it's a historical artifact. It, it artifacts, I guess. It might be, you know, if you pull out, uh, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, <laughs> you may not be able to put it on your mantle. They, the Canadian government say, hey, "Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Let's let's check this out. Let's slow things down. We're going to bring in some experts here. Take a look at this. Whatever it might be." But well, there's a finder's fee, at least, right? The government's going to pay them. There you go. Something. something. Here's 50 bucks, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and then Justin Trudeau gets to keep it in his <laughs> living room. <laughs> I, like melt out of their heads when they open it up. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great. Um, the the spinoff about the Civil War goal didn't last. Uh, it lasted two seasons, right? Were there any discoveries there that uh, you enjoyed? Yeah, I thought I thought the entire the concept was very fascinating. Just the idea that the uh, Confederate and it makes sense. The Confederacy obviously had a treasury, and uh, that treasury didn't just exist or didn't just consist of uh, banknotes with you know just paper, because people would in the South would donate to it. They donate jewelry. They donate uh, uh, gold, silver. Um, so, you know, this is how they paid for their war effort and it wasn't bankrupt at the end of the civil war. It must've gone somewhere. And it is true that, that Jefferson Davis did try to escape. He was, I guess, dressed up in disguise as a woman. There were, um, these trains that were, were trying to take that, uh, or carts, whatever, whatever it was. Uh, that were trying to take it away because he was on his way to Mexico and he was intercepted. And the whatever was there, whatever the, the values were, were, somehow disappeared. And suddenly the people, it seems that the people that were involved with his capture uh, suddenly had a lot of money <laughs> to do a lot of crazy things. Yeah, funny uh, how that works out. Funny how that works out. So, you know, you ask the question, is it possible that that a, a box car that's filled with some of this loot could have fallen off of a, a barge in in the lake, in Lake Michigan and gone to the bottom there? Yeah. I mean, there are people that say they saw it go off. What was in it? They didn't see what was in it. But is it there? It's a good possibility. Yeah. So I found it I found it to be very, very interesting. And I know we've uh, you know, we've talked about it a couple of times in either aliens or Oak Island, just to kind of, kind of draw a few comparisons or connections together. But yeah, I found, I thought it was very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. And with the show beyond Oak Island, what I love about that is that we're exploring, we're not just focused on one. We're focused on a lot of these, these, these mysteries that are out there as to where, um, these valid, valuables may be like Pancho Villa or uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Uh, all these people had loot. They had cash. And it went somewhere. Where well, maybe it? they ought to tackle our own local treasure, uh, which is the Lost Dutchman. The Lost Dutchman we, mine. We we did that on Beyond Oak Island. We did the Lost oh, Dutchman mine. Oh, I didn't see that episode. Oh, I missed that one. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Have you well, guys done an episode that. on the <laughs> on the secret? You know, you know what the, the secret is the the treasure hunt where the guy put out that book uh -huh. in 1982, and there are paintings, and the paintings are the clues, and he hid these treasures in different cities, and you 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 got these clues, you know, and a and a couple of the clues have been found. Mm -hmm. 
but I was wondering if you guys would ever, if you guys are ever going to go like, I, and what I, it was supposed to be was you, you figure out the clues and you find like, and it tells you that you want to give it to them and you send it. There, there's 12, of, there's like, I, there's 12 of them. Three of them have been found out of the 12. And it, yeah, it's, it's, and you, you send it to them and then one, it, once it's sent to them, they send you back your, your treasure for it. They give you, it's 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 all it's all fascinating. We've done a show about uh, about Blackbeard. Uh, it's it's you know it's 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 crazy. It ever all around the world, there are stories of where somebody's buried treasure yeah. somewhere. And I just looked it up. It's on the the Beyond Oak Island yeah. spinoff, right? Yeah. Okay, Beyond Oak Island. And yeah. I th I think uh, Gary Drayton go is in is in that one. Gary Drayton is amazing. First of all. He's the he's the fellow he's the, the the British British fellow that says you know top pocket finds and Bobby Dazzlers, and he's got the Midas touch. Whenever he pulls out that that metal detector, he he finds something. It's not just bottle caps. Yeah, it's not just bottle caps. <laughs> one of the shows, and it might have been the Lost Dutchman mine. I can't remember which one it was. He was in Arizona or wherever, and and they were looking for you know, some hidden treasure or gold, wherever it might've been, maybe it was Confederate. I don't know something. And uh, there was one guy who was on the show who'd been searching for decades and hadn't really found very much. And he basically told Gary, yeah, you know, go over there and, you know, search. And, and it was an area that he'd already gone through. And literally within like an hour, Gary's like <laughs> getting all these hits and finding stuff. He's amazing. He's amazing. That's great. So, so, uh, did you get to the, I haven't seen the Dutchman episode, but did you guys get to the bottom of anything? All we know, the legend around here is that the mine is in the shadow of the Weaver's Needle. Mm -hmm. And the Weaver's Needle is a, a famous um, rock formation in the desert out to the east of Phoenix here. And that doesn't give a lot of clue because, you know, the shadow spins around every day. But uh, did they get to the bottom of anything? I, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to remember the, the specifics of it. Because we we do talk about uh, the different stories that are involved with it, and uh, who put it there, why was it there, um, and I, I can't remember the specifics on the show. I mean, I don't I don't think we found the yeah. mine. I mean, it would have been it would have been the right. find of the century. But we did talk to a lot of people that were there who have been searching, and I, I found the show to be interesting. Yeah. Certainly. Interesting. And to know that there's something out there that is yet to be found. Eventually it will be. Hopefully. Yeah. One the one other show we wanted to to kind of briefly cover, you in addition to the voiceover work, you're also an actor. Yeah. And you did some appearances in a show that took place here in Phoenix called Medium. Um <laughs> and you know, it the the question I have about that is. What's your take on psychics? Having dealt with the treasure hunts and the and the alien, ancient aliens, do you have any opinion on psychics or Alison Dubois in, in particular? You know, we've well, I, I enjoyed working on the show. I did primarily voiceover work in that show, probably you know, half a dozen episodes. Um, I I think that the human mind and what we're capable of, we're just scratching the surface. It gets back to you know how truly evolved are we? I think we're pretty much Neanderthals as far as in the grand scheme of things. So, is there a possibility that people have within them, within their brains, within their minds, the ability to pick up on nuances that the average person may not be able to to pick up on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know we. You know, we there, and we and we talked about in in one of the alien shows just last week about the uh, the color spectrum. I mean, we can only see, and Georgia talked about it, we can only see this amount of color. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean the other colors aren't there. We just can't see them. So why can't right. that be true with psychics as well? I mean, I've gone to to uh, to to psychics. I had people talk to me and. It's kind of surprising. I know that there. I'm also a member of the Magic Castle, so I know that there's also uh, gimmicks that fake psychics can can do to kind of get you to believe. But Wait, I what is that? What is the Magic Castle? 
What does oh, that mean? You don't have the magic. The Magic Castle is one of the, I guess, one of the most famous private clubs in in Los Angeles. Been there since like early 1960s and it is uh it's at this old mansion built in the 1920s in the hollywood hills and it is a clubhouse dedicated to the art of magic so you've got all the best magicians from all over the world have either performed there or members there i mean it is dedicated to the art of magic and uh, they also have members who are like me who are not magicians and uh, are able to go up there and you get to see magic shows. People are performing all the time. You know, people doing psychic routines. You'll have people doing card tricks. Uh, you know, people sawing a woman in half. I mean, you name it. It's it 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 goes on up there. So it's it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful club. So That's fascinating. Yeah, I've been a member there, so I so I I know of uh, of of some psychics that go up there and perform, and I I know that it's it's an act. You know, you know that they they can tell that you're tell, yeah. So to speak, and like in poker, you know they're you know the tell. Yeah, there, there's or the way they ask questions. I mean, there's all yeah. kinds of stuff. we leading and, but there but there are legitimate. I I honestly believe there are people out there that do have this intuitive sense that maybe not all of us have developed yet. Theirs is more developed than others. So yeah, who am I to say no? You know, somebody will all of a sudden go, oh, the, the body is buried X, Y, Z. And then you go there and you find it. How did that person know? It's not a mm -hmm. parlor trick. Just something. Yeah, that's and, something. And I think actually we all have a certain amount of a psychic ability. We just often deny it. Um, I studied and taught martial arts for a lot of years. And one of the things that I encourage people to do is trust your gut. Yeah. You just get a feeling that, hey, something's not right. You could be wrong, but there's no harm in just believing that. It's it's usually it's that quiet little voice that is telling you something. That's the one that we all kind of deny. Go, oh, it can't be. No, no, I'm not gonna believe that. No, 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 no. I want it. because we're focused on something else. So I think we all have a certain amount of a psychic ability. You know when something's wrong. You walk into a room and you just get a vibe that this isn't right. Where where is that coming from? Everybody may be smiling, and yet. The fact that they're smiling, that just gives you a weird feeling. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You, you don't know what that means, but it just, you know, you're, you're affected by it. So yeah, I, I believe there's, there's psychics out there. I believe. Yeah. I think you're right. I think there's something to that. My wife, I think she's a little psychic because she'll, she'll ask me if I'm mad and I'm not mad that she'll ask me again and again and again. And then eventually I'm mad. So she saw it coming. <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> women have that ability, guys. We're we're, we're totally clueless. I, I one of my favorite cartoons in a magazine called The New Yorker. It shows these two cave women walking, and one is looking very depressed, and the other cave woman turns to her and says, "They're all Neanderthals." <laughs> <laughs> So, so, yeah, guys, we're we're pretty clueless. We're knuckle draggers. Thank goodness there's women out there that uh, have, have a little bit more of that intuitive sense. Oh, yeah. And pick up on the nuance. That is amazing. Robert, thank you so much for, for spending an, your time with us today. I know your time is, is valuable, but it means a lot to us that you would take the time. And um, where can people find you? Uh, you know, you're on, you're doing your, your shows. You've got, you still got uh, Oak Island. Ancient aliens are still on history channel. Yeah. Any other projects we need to know about? Uh, yeah. If, if you haven't seen a uh, red notice, please watch that because I do the opening narration for, for red notice. The, the director Ross and Thurber was, or is a big fan of ancient aliens and uh, contacted me directly. It was really very, very flattering. He actually wrote the opening monologue to, to the movie with, with me in mind. And uh, it's it's a it's a really really fun film to uh, to see. So if you haven't seen it, it's great. You know, three no. It is, it is a fun movie. I, I watched it the when it came out. I don't know if Kyle, you've seen it, but probably it's on Netflix. Um, it was in theaters as well, but it's on Netflix right now. Yeah, it's got it's got three nobodies in it. Uh, you know, Dwayne Johnson, Gallagher, <laughs> and Ryan Reynolds. Just oh, I have seen that now. <laughs> I remember now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who's ever heard of those people? Yeah. <laughs> And it's you know, it's interesting. It act, I, I had lunch, or actually, I had dinner with uh, the director about a month and a half ago, and he was telling me that the uh, 
the movie, the, the way they do the metrics on movies is how many people watch it. Well, mm -hmm. Netflix has a way that look at like total viewing hours and they figure, okay, total viewing hours, that opening week weekend were X number. And we figure at least two people were watching it at the same time, maybe three, but let's go to two and a half. And they multiplied that and it came up to like this crazy number of like 750 thousand people. I mean, it was like 750 million, some crazy number. I, I don't even remember how high it was, but the bottom line, it was higher than the viewership of any movie ever released anywhere of all time. Because yeah, it, it was big. It was huge. Plus, yeah. plus the people in the theaters who were watching it. Yeah. They, they would look at say the latest Batman movie that's out and they go, okay, it made X million dollars. We divide that by 10 because that's what the average price of a ticket is. Now we know how many people went. That's yeah. how, basically how they how they compare. Um, yeah, so I'm certainly on uh, on Facebook. I, I'm trying to remember what, what my handle is there. Real Rob Clown, where there's something also on Instagram or uh, or Twitter, and uh, and I I have those fan pages, and I do kind of love to interface with with fans, tell them what's going on, uh, keep them up to date. I'm also available on these sites called like like Cameo. Have you ever heard of Cameo? Oh yeah, where mm -hmm. people do a, uh, you know, can, you know, can contact me and, uh, you know, I'll give them a little birthday greeting in an ancient aliens or a curse of Oak Island kind of a way, and also on a site called Jemmy, where I actually take my personal scripts that I have for each of those shows and I hold on to them, and I actually would normally I would make these available at at conventions for for purchase, and since we're not having conventions, I decided okay, you know, I'm going to have a marketplace because a lot of people are interested in that having a having a true, unique item from those shows. So you I'll, said that was Jemmy, Jemmy, J E M I, J E M I. That's it, it, it's, we're, it's, we're, cool. I, I put like a nice little cover on it. I I autograph it, put whatever you want in it, send it in a like a padded envelope so it's pristine and perfect. And it's my it's my personal copy. There's no there's not a second copy. It's got my own little notes in there. If I don't know how to pronounce something, I'll write it in. So it's it's pretty special. That's it's perfect. Like your own treasure. Kyle and I we're in a community of comic book collectors and card collectors, and we also like to collect all these other memorabilia. So that's perfect. We're definitely uh, push that around. Jemmy, mm -hmm. Jemmy.com. Is that where it's at? It's like, it's like, yeah, Jemmy, Jemmy.com. And you punch in my name, Jemmy, and it should pop up. And I got, I got to say that um, I'm very touched by the influence and the positive influence that these shows have had a lot of people. Just last week I was uh, contacted through Cameo to do a little greeting for uh, a, a father contacting me for this 12 year old boy who is uh, dealing with a, a type of cancer, type of uh, type of lymphoma that he had. And he'd been, I think, in the hospital like 26 out of the last 30 weeks. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, I mean, 12 years old. I mean, come on. I mean, he's yeah. kind of playing in the backyard and having fun. But I, I sent him a little encouraging uh, message. And then I also sent him, uh, I told him, I said, I said, I'm going into the studio today to, to uh, record a new episode. I'm going to dedicate this episode to you. And I'm going to send you this script. And I sent it to him and they wrote back to me and they were so thrilled and excited and happy. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's just a, a, these shows, it's nice to be part of something that actually makes people happy. It's, it's really nice as opposed to, you know, something that is, is, is designed just to make you angry or piss you off or whatever. So it's, it's, I understand that there is a purpose beyond what it is that we're doing here. That that people get a, a real benefit out of out of these shows and a and a true joy, and it's it's so gratifying to be a part of it. And again, you guys, you know, you, you alluded to it as well. I mean, you're having a good time watching those shows, and it oh, yeah. let your minds kind of go into all these crazy places and having fun. And we're you know we we show no sign of slowing down. That's excellent. That's great. Well, uh, to our audience, thank you for tuning in, um, and we will catch you next time on Thresholds of Reality. Mm -hmm.